And if you would take your copy of Scripture and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 11 as the children make their way back to the back of the auditorium. We're going to be reading from the English Standard Version. We're going to read chapter 11 beginning in verse 7 through chapter 12 verse 8. Chapter 11 verse 7 through 12 8. You can follow on the screen behind me if you choose. Hear the word of God. Light is sweet and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. But let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. And let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. Remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body. For youth and the dawn of life are vanity. Chapter 12, verse 1. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble, And the strong men are bent, and the grinders cease because they are few. And those who look through the windows are dimmed, and the doors of the street are shut. When the sound of the grinding is low, and one rises up at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high, and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along. And desire fails, because man is going to his eternal home. And the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and their spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Let's pray together. Our Father, what a privilege it is to be able to come to these verses and hear what you would say to us this morning. We pray for clarity, we pray for understanding, we pray for conviction, we pray for change. Lord, we ask that we would be obedient, that we would listen to a view to obedience and change and understanding. Father, help us, give us ears to hear as we pray in Jesus' name, amen. May be seated. Well, we have uh, almost concluded our series in Ecclesiastes. Next Sunday, Lord willing, we will be in the last verses of chapter 12. But for this morning, we want to consider the verses that we just read together. And one of the great lessons learned from our verse-by-verse study of Ecclesiastes this summer has been this, if we really want to live, we need to go to a funeral. We need to take in all the sights, we need to take in all the sounds, we need to hear the tears, and we need to experience the grief of those who are in attendance, and we need to think about our life. If we really want to enjoy life now, in the present, and enjoy all the good gifts that God gives, then go sit in a cemetery just for a little while. And contemplate all the experiences and the joys and the disappointments that those who are buried there must have had in this life. Read the headstone and and think about how few years those who are buried there had in this life. I mean, that's really what Solomon has been saying to us as we've worked our way verse by verse all the way through until we come to these verses and we see the same thing here in these verses. If you really want to enjoy life, you've got to think about the end. If you want to live life with joy and anticipation and with hope, then you have to live it with the end in view. That's really the best way to live. And that's the opposite of what we think. That's the opposite of how we 
think about life. But if we live with the view in with the end in view, then we learn that life is a gift. And God has given us good things about life to enjoy. And we don't have to just go through life enduring, but we can actually go through life enjoying. And, and that's really, again, what Solomon has been telling us all of the journal that he has kept. And, of course, it's the inspired word of God. And so what does the wisest man who ever lived other than Jesus have to say to us about our subject this morning, about youth and old age? What does he have to say to us about being in the prime of your life? And what does he have to say to us about the waning years of your life? He has a lot to say here, and we're going to need to hurry through this as much as we can, and yet try to glean from it all that we can say that would be encouraging and helpful. So Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 7 through 10, Solomon has a lot to say to those who are young. It goes all the way to chapter 12, verse 1. And you understand, and I understand, our culture is obsessed with youth, with uh, being young. I mean, that's why cosmetic surgery is so popular, cosmetic surgery to make you look younger. Uh, that's why we watch billboards and listen to television advertisements and radio advertisements and magazine advertisements, and they extol the beauty and the virtues of youth. And, and old age is something that you want to avoid. Old age is something that ought to be fought against with everything that you have as if we could actually slow down the natural processes of aging. But yet that's what we emphasize and that's what we push. And so vitamins and health regimens are, are touted as the way to have a young life and to keep a young life. And magazines and, and sports and, and entertainment are, are constant reminders that this life is for those who are young. In fact, I would go so far to say, and this is not just from me, but I would go so far as to say that, that most of our culture would deem that the important people are between the ages of 18 and 30. The rest of us are just tolerated because they can't kill us. <laughs> and, and, and the truth and the reality is, and what Solomon is going to help us to understand, that youth is enjoyable. It's an exciting stage of life. You, you ought to feel the wonder and the blessing of <clears throat> that <clears throat> excuse me, time of life. There is certainly a sweetness. There is certainly a joy about youth. And we look back, those of us who are 55 plus, look back and we remember fondly the days of our youth when you could jump out of the back of a pickup truck with the tailgate up. And you weren't fearful to do that. I wouldn't do that for $100 now. Because you know what will happen. I'll break an ankle or something. So um, youth is something to enjoy. And that's what we're going to talk about in these verses. But, but it is fleeting. It passes swiftly. It goes quickly. And vanity is constantly nipping at our heels, vanity and brevity, constantly chasing us. Every step we take, we're reminded of how short life is. And so what we're going to see is that Solomon is going to advocate for all of you who are 18 to 30 to enjoy your life, enjoy the moments, give you uh, God has given you great gifts to enjoy and to um, be excited about, to be blessed in. And so let's begin here in verse 7 and see what Solomon says particularly. Notice he says, light is sweet, and he uses the word pleasant about the eyes seeing the sun. In other words, how sweet life is, how good life it is, and how good it is to be alive. It is a pleasant and good thing to be enjoyed all the good things that God has given. 
So to enjoy life under the sun, and this is for all of us, it's not just 18 to 30, but all of us, enjoy life under the sun. Savor the experiences and the relationships and the opportunities as blessings that God has given us. Don't begrudge the things that we get to experience. Don't be negative and complaining and murmuring and whining and always jealous and envious of other people and what they have and what you don't have. But enjoy life and all the good things that God gives you to enjoy. Your spouse and your children and food and drink and work and rest. These are God's gifts to us. And so it's good to be alive. It's good to have those gifts to enjoy. And especially while you're young. Notice verse 8. So if a person lives many years and they live into older age, let him rejoice in all of them. So no matter where you are in your stage of life, the point is that you ought to rejoice in all the days that you have. Enjoy life under the sun. Enjoy the fact that your eyes see the sun. And in verse 8 really is a, is a call to enjoy all your life. If you have many years, rejoice in all of those years. While you're young, really live with joy. Look at it. It says there in verse 8, but let him <coughs> remember, that is the young person, let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. Rejoice in the opportunities and the relationships and the responsibility that God gives you, but remember that youth is short. That time, that stage of your life is just the short part of your life. Old age. Old age is referred to here as the days of darkness. The days of darkness when you don't see the brightness of the sun. Light is not sweet. There's not a pleasant light that you enjoy in life. Old age is when you can't always experience the, the sweetness and the pleasant warmth and light of the sun. So while you're young, enjoy the days that you have. Experience them with all the grace that God provides. And so listen, Solomon is not trying to depress us here, thinking that if you're 55 plus, he's not saying to you, you got a lot of dark days and a lot of bad stuff ahead of you. Now, it's true, there are some dark days and there are some uh, moments that it will be difficult. But, but he's trying to help us to see that all of God's days, all of God's gifts are good. Even in old age, we are blessed. And, and even in old age, when we have many days of old age, it is still God's goodness. Even though, as he says at the end of verse 8, <clears throat> all of the future is vanity. It's vanity and brevity. Whether you're young or whether you're old, life is vanity. It's brief and it seems worthless and difficult at times. And Solomon is saying, don't live your life that way. Don't waste it by trying to be um, or being depressed and discouraged with a cloud over you all the time thinking about how bad your life is. Look at verse 9. Rejoice, 18 to 30. Oh, young man, rejoice. This is a command. This is not a suggestion. This is a command, and there's an urgency to this command. The idea is to be joyful. It's wonderful to be young, he's saying. It's wonderful to be young and to enjoy all the good gifts from God. This is a command to you, if you're young, to have joy in life. It is as binding as do not murder. You ought to have joy with your life. You ought to live it with its fullness and recognition of who God is. Let all of God's gifts be something unique and wondrous to you. While you're young in these wonderful days of your life, be of great joy. Look at it, verse 9. 
Let your heart cheer you. That means have a lot of joy. Be cheerful. While you're young, recognize that what you have before you is the gift of God in life and living and opportunities and responsibilities and hopes, privileges. So embrace it. Rejoice in it and embrace it. Now the last half of this verse can be scary if you look at this through the uh, lens of a Disney movie. So don't do that. Let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. Listen, this is not permission to indulge your life in whatever worldly pleasures you want to find. He's not saying that. He's not saying whatever you want to find in revelry or moral indiscretions or wanton desires, go do it. He's not saying that. He said all the way through the journal that living just for pleasure is not living. So he's certainly not advocating it here. And though Disney would say, follow your heart and do whatever you want, I know. That's not what Solomon is saying. He is saying here that while you're young, while there's opportunity, while there's health, while there's hope, while there's privilege, make sure you take advantage of it. Don't waste your life. Don't be considering all the trivial and insignificant things that the culture wants you to buy into. Don't make those a priority. Don't be careless. Don't be foolish. But learn from the opportunities and the experiences that God gives you. Don't be childish. Get caught up in all of the cultural fads and cultural expectations. You don't have to look a certain way. You don't have to act a certain way. You don't have to drive a certain car. You don't have to have a certain amount of education. All that is man-made stuff to weigh us down. Now, those things can certainly be good gifts. But those things that are not to be what you live for, don't believe the lies of the culture. That's what he's saying. Follow your heart and walk in the sight of your eyes. Be guarded. Be careful. Don't be careless and frivolous with the opportunities and with the monies and with the experiences that you have. Walk with God. Pursue Him. Grow in grace and knowledge. Make sanctification a priority. Learn skills and learn knowledge that will last you all of your days. Don't waste your life. That's what he's saying. That's a good word when you're young. You need to hear that. You need to know how to think. I mean, ask those of us who are 55 plus. Ask us about our life. And we can rehearse to you wasted days and wasted nights. Is that a song? (laughs) Wasted days and wasted years. It just came to my mind, you know? I mean, we can talk to you about wasted opportunities and experiences and joys. We can talk to you about that. Because that's what happens sometimes when you don't pay attention. You don't give God priority. When you waste the gifts of God, don't do that. Don't give yourself to silly and unprofitable pursuits. And now be careful, look. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. See, that's the balance. That's where you say, follow your heart and the side of your eyes, but know this. All the foolish, wasteful, trivial things that you involve yourself in, all those things that you give your heart to that are worldly and not profitable, there's a judgment day that you're going to have to answer for that. There's an accountability that you're going to have to give. See, doesn't that keep that intention? That, that's why youth is so important. It's so important for you to see that it's a gift. And verse 10 helps you to see that. Remove vexation from your heart. It, it, it really uh, brings us back to the end of verse 9. Uh, the, the word vexation translated here uh, means... Uh, in Hebrew, uh, don't be angry. 
are grieved or provoked to wrath. In other words, here, here's what he's saying. I think the best way to say it is this. Solomon is saying, put away anger and bitterness and jealousy and the pain of comparison and depression and division and anxiety. Put all of that away, That all of those stuff that eat at all of the good gifts and pleasures that God gives us in this life. Put all that junk aside. And don't be angry about your life. Don't be always comparing yourself to other people. Don't be depressed and discouraged and let all of that stuff just gnaw at you and grief and sadness be more a part of your life than joy. Don't let bitterness and anger be what characterizes your life, but let joy, thanksgiving, be what characterizes your life. Don't let the miseries of this life overwhelm you. Life is, listen, life is too short, isn't it? To be bitter and angry and disgruntled and whining and complaining all the time. It's too short to do that, he's saying. Why waste your life doing that? We're pretty good at it, aren't we? Pretty good at whining and complaining and murmuring. I mean, this is a good word for us. Look, look, he says that youth and the dawn of life are vanity. Our lives are vapors. You go out on a cold morning and blow out, and that little vapor that appears from your, the warmness of your breath, that's what your life is. It's how long it lasts. So why do you want to waste it? In all the stages of your life, in childhood, in youth, in adulthood, and in old age, why would you ever want to waste your life being bitter and vexed and angry? So listen, he's saying to you as young people, you, you need to make sure that you follow God. Do the things that will count for eternity Decisions that you make when you're 18, 19, 25, 27, 30, decisions that you make then will sometimes affect the rest of your life. And it can be negative. It can be a lot of consequences. So that we come to chapter 12, verse 1, and Solomon is continuing to write about youth and old age here, or rather youth and being young. He's going to write about old age beginning in verse 2. And we're going to be able to go through it pretty rapidly. But look, he says to the young, remember. Remember also your creator. Now, the idea is don't forget God in your youth. It's easy to do that because there's so many other things that the world offers you. And those things are easy to buy into. And there's a command, just as there was a command to rejoice So now for those of us who are young, remember. And remember in the scripture has more than just mentally, cognitively thinking and recalling an event. But the idea of remember here is the idea of action. To do something with intentionality. So remember your Texas history. Remember the Alamo. It was more than just... thinking about the event that happened on March the 6th, 1836, when Sam Houston and his men on April the 17th, 1836, defeated Santa Ana. When they said, remember the Alamo as they charged on the battlefield, it had the intention to it. Not just think about it with your mind, but do something. That's what's being said here. Remember. Think about, but embrace, follow your creator, the one who has given you life, the one who owns your life. You don't get to make the rules. He makes the rules. He's the creator. He's the God enthroned. He is the sovereign. He is the Lord. He is the one who reigns high and receives no counsel from anybody. So remember him. That will add balance to your life cause you to make him a priority 
And notice what he says. Do this in the days of your youth before the evil days. There it is again. The evil days being old age. Before the evil days come and the years draw near of which he will say, I have no pleasure in them. Because once old age sets in, and you reach that stage of life, begin to have no pleasure in life. The sun and the warmth of the sun and the light of the sun becomes less pleasant. It's not as sweet. Now listen, I'm going to take just a moment, a parenthesis to say this, because you don't really get it from these verses, but just to say that in the Scripture, old age is honored. Um, old age is respected. Old age is viewed as significant and important. It is not something that is taught in the Bible that you would loathe, that you would despise old age. You're to respect old age. As you grow older, you become wiser about the things of life. As you grow older, you have experiences that can be a benefit to those who are young. Uh, in old age, you can begin to hate your sin better. In old age, you can begin to think about heaven better. You can begin to love Jesus more because you don't have all the push and pull of the other things of life. You've been there. You've, you know, the saying goes, you've got the t-shirt. You don't need all that stuff that in youth seems to push and pull against you. It seems to become priority in your life. So, so look, he's not saying that old age is something to despise and hate here. He's just trying to say to you, whether you're young or whether you're old, you need to enjoy all the wonderful gifts of God. Now, what do the evil days, the days of old age look like? Beginning in verse T, look at it. These are pictures, word pictures. It's poetic metaphors. They're very vivid. He, he says, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened. Again, just a, a, a picture of the age, the old age in which uh, the, the, the light of the moon and the stars and the sun uh, begin to wane. A physical ailments, uh, setbacks increase and become common. The days are darker. It becomes harder, as I said, to enjoy the sun, the moon, the light. Um, in old age, look, the old age, clouds come and a rain happens. And as soon as the rain stops, what do you get? More clouds. Look, you know, two weeks ago I had all these flu-like symptoms and had fever and Stayed home a couple of days, and I rarely stay home, um, but felt like it was necessary. And then all this week, I mean, just right back, it rained that week, and then the, the rain stopped, and the clouds came back, and all week I've had this stomach virus, all stinking week. Finally quit yesterday. I mean, that, that's what old age does, right? I mean, you, you get through one illness, and the next one comes. When you're, when you're young, yeah, right, Betsy? Yeah, when you're young, you, you bounce back quicker. Yeah, uh, you, you can weather the downpours better. I, when you're young, uh, you tend to recover from illnesses better. Uh, the body begins to break down, and, and you, life in old age is filled with a lot of doctor visits, isn't it? You're always looking for the next prescription, and where the address of the next doctor is, always. And Jared and Duffy laugh at me and they mock me because I'm old compared to them. This is the truth. And notice what Solomon says. He, he says um, in verse 3, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble. You know what he's talking about? The keepers of the house, they're your arms, your, your hands. They tremble, they get weak, they get tired, easier, they begin to shake. 
We were visiting with a man yesterday in his old age. We were talking with him outside. And out, the whole time we're talking, he was just shaking. The keepers of the house tremble, and the strong men, and some of your translations say valiant men, they are bent. He's talking about the legs. They're not strong. Uh, the knees and the hips wear out. And in, in old age, you lose confidence in walking. Your steps are not as sure. It, you're more deliberate in your steps because you don't want to fall. Look at this. The grinders cease because they are few. What are the grinders? Uh, the teeth. I mean, in old age, there's a lot of implants and root canals and caps and dentures. That's what your teeth are. And you do all that. Why? Because you want to save as many grinders as you can, right? Because if they become too few, what do you do? Look at this. Notice, those who look through the windows are dim. Your eyesight goes. When you're old... Like me, you have to wear reading glasses. You know, I'm trying, I'm trying to announce the football games on Friday nights, and I have to have a spotter now. I have to have somebody to tell me that was number 27 because I cannot see it. I just can't see it like it used to. I mean, it's, it's, it's a sad reality. That's what happens in old age. And listen, this is what Solomon is saying. That remember your creator in your youth. Enjoy your youth because this is what you're going to have to look forward to. These are things are the reality of old age. Notice not only that the uh, eyes are dimmed, but the doors of the street are shut. Uh, shut. The sound of grinding is low. Uh, that is, you don't hear. You lose your hearing. I'm having a hearing. I'm going to a hearing doctor this Friday, because I can't hear anything. I, I, it's pitiful. I mean, every time if Jared or Duffy or Lisa talks in the office, I have to say, what? I cannot hear. So, hearing goes. Look at this. And when you're in old age, one rises up at the sound of a bird. You can't hear, but boy, you can hear the bird chirp in the morning about 4 30 and wake up. And you can't sleep, right? Look, all the daughters of song are, are brought low. And, and when you in old age, verse, verse 5, they're afraid of what is high. There's no more ladders. There's no more stairs. You don't do that when you're old. And not only that, but there are terrors in the way. You shuffle your feet. You, you, you're, not, you're, you're scared to take steps. You're always looking down to see where the ground is unlevel. You're afraid that you're going to fall. The almond tree blossoms. What does an al almond tree blossom look like? It's white. Your hair turns white in old age. I mean, these are poetic metaphors, right? But it's true. This is the reality. Uh, the grasshopper drags itself along. You, you just shuffle. You just kind of move slow, shuffle along. You're not confident. You're careful. Um, there's no urgency, uh, and if there was urgency, you can't really make it any faster. <clears throat> and then desire, sexual desire fails. And why? Because man is going to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets because old age and the body failing gives way to what? Death. What happens? You make all the arrangements for the funeral. You order the tombstone or the headstone, I should say. You get all the pallbearers lined up. Get the music lined up. The mourners go about the streets. And look, you need to think about this in your youth before, verse 6, the silver cord is snapped, the golden bowl is broken, the picture is shattered at the fountain or the will is broken at the cistern. All of those are just metaphors, pictures of death. You need to make sure that you think about your life and get opportunity 
um, to think wisely and biblically about the gifts that God has given. And what happens? The dust, verse 7, returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So they put you in that coffin, they put it underground, and the body turns to the dust from which it was created, as we read in Genesis. And here's the good news, though. Look, our lives don't end when dust returns to dust. Our lives don't end there because the soul lives forever. And the soul can go in the presence of God. The soul can rejoice forevermore in the glories and the security and the hope and the majesty and the beauty of being with Christ Jesus. The soul can go there. And to think that life just ends when dust returns to dust. Or once our eyes are closed in death, then that's it. That, that's a wrong way to think. This is, look, even in old age, you need to understand that there's still hope and the knowledge that we have of the fact that our soul lives causes us then to be um, joyful, hopeful, not overwhelmed by the fear of death, not living in dread and fear, even in old age. You don't have to live with some kind of sense of dread about the fact that it's coming to an end. I think it was uh, Dr. Seuss. I thought this quote was good. Dr. Seuss reportedly said, don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. See, look, if you're counting on living forever in this life, um, can't count on that, right? Look around you. There's a lot of 55 plus in here. But the truth is that you will. And so you've got to prepare now. Whether you're young, whether you're old, you've got to recognize that you're a sinner separated from God. And if you don't humble yourself and repent of your sin and turn to Christ Jesus, the only way of salvation, that you will actually spend eternity in a God-forsaken hell. And so you must repent. You must humble yourself. You must turn from your wicked ways. You must recognize that you are hopeless and undone and that you have nothing other than Jesus Christ who will save your soul. You must not just believe, but you must believe with a view to obedience. You must believe who the Jesus of the Bible is. Not what culture says. Believe in the Jesus that the Bible preaches. He is the Son of God. He did come and live the life that you can never live. He did suffer and die the death that you deserve. And three days later, he rose from the grave. He ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he's alive right there, and he will come and return to this earth and judge the living and the dead. You must repent, and you must believe that. This is the message of Solomon. He says, finally in verse 8, as we close, he says, all of this, whether it's youth, whether it's old age, Whatever it is, brevity of brevity, or vanity of vanities, or the Hebrew word is havel. Havel means brevity. It means vanity. Um, Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. So where do we go from here? Come back next week and we'll figure it out. (laughs) We'll look at it together beginning there in verse 9 of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. My prayer is that God has uh, not, or God has spoken to you. You've not become discouraged. You've not become disappointed about the stage of life that you're in, but you've been motivated to enjoy life better, whatever stage of life you are. I mean, it's just too short to be bitter at your next-door neighbor and your boss and your children and your parents. Why? Why live like that? It's too short 
not to take advantage of all the opportunities that youth provides. It's too short to be bitter because you can't do what you could do when you were 30 and now you're 60 or you're 70 or you're 61. Let's enjoy life the way that God meant for us to do it. If you've never accepted Christ, you'd like to talk with me. Please see me after the worship service, and we'll dismiss with prayer and music here. But I'll be glad to talk with you if you'd like to get to know Jesus in a way that would save your soul. Let's pray together.